Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's seminar. I'm Beth Mischewski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and seminar co-organizer. Today's seminar is the last seminar in our Fall 2018 series. Watch for more information after the new year about our Spring 2019 series. I'll remind everyone in our audience here to please silence electronic devices as we are recording today's seminar. We'll also hold all questions until the end, at which time I will bring around the microphone so that those online can hear your questions. For those online, you can type in your questions at any time and we'll answer those at the end as well. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Raj Bir Singh. Raj is a research scientist in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His previous work includes research associate at Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois. He also was a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Institute for Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois. He earned his PhD in environmental engineering at Drexel University. His main research in interests include uh, studying reactive transport in subsurface porous media using microfluids and chemical imaging techniques. And his broad interests include geological carbon sequestration, in situ bioremediation of contaminated aquifers, fate and transport of bacteria and contaminants in groundwater, environmental microfluids, water and wastewater treatment, and geoenvironmental engineering. Please join me in welcoming Raj. All right. Okay. Thanks, Beth. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and you pretty much covered everything. Uh, so I just started at Drexel University last um, month, and before that, I was uh, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, so uh, as the title suggests, I'm going to be talking about the microfluidics and chemical engine, chemical imaging and their application in studying different subsurface uh, processes. Um, so before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, direct or indirect contribution of my different collaborator. Uh, uh, until like last month, I was uh, in Beckman with Rohit's lab, and then we had Dr. Ahmad and Tomik uh, helping me or in, in different projects. And then there are some pretty well-known faces in Illinois campus, Charlie Wirth, who, is at, who, were, who was at Civil and Environmental Engineering, Professor Falk, uh, Professor Valoki, Rob Sanford, and my other uh, co-workers. And then, you know, I also want to acknowledge uh, my PhD work, some of which I will be presenting my advisor, Mira Olson, and uh, Chuck Haas, uh, and Marcus Helpert, who helped me uh, shaping my ideas. Um, so just to give you outlines, I'm going to be talking about two things, uh, basically, microfluidics and chemical imaging and their applications. So why and how we use uh, these uh, microfluidic, and then I'll give you a couple of examples that I, a couple of studies that I did, and then I'll talk about this entirely different type of flu microfluidic test bed that we developed in our, in uh, with Charlie Worth and uh, Bruce Falk. And then I'll talk about the chemical imaging, why we need them in uh, subsurface analysis. And then uh, I assume that uh, for the, the audience I'm talking to, I'll just go over some basics, how this works. And for their subsurface application, uh, some couple of other projects. And if I still have time, then I'll talk about a it's one of the projects that I have just started on public health issues uh, here at Drexel. Uh, so uh, to start with, basically any groundwater problem, whether it's contamination or geological se carbon sequestration. Uh, for example, here I'm showing a contamination of groundwater because of the leakage of an underground storage tank. So it has two aspects. One is uh, a flow aspect and then other is a uh, porous media aspect, basically. So our typical uh, lab reactor that we do, you know, flask reactor that we kind of study in environmental engineering, they don't capture these two things. Neither, and most of the time, there is no porous media 
and there is no continuous laminar flow uh, that that exists in subsurface processes. So um, what people have done in you know past is that they use these uh, uh, plug uh, basically column column experiments. So they pack these columns with uh, soil or depends on whatever like you know granular material, and then we sort of inject preferably from the bottom, like the, the groundwater or whatever we want to study, and then we collect sample here. So what we have basically, uh, we have inlet characteristic and outlet characteristic, and then we get kind of, if we are looking at the bacterial transport, so we kind of get these breakthrough curves where we only know inlet characteristic and outlet characteristic, and we don't have any idea about what's going on, what's the interaction between microbes, uh, if we're studying microbe or chemical and how they're attaching, detaching those kind of processes. Um, and then we use this black box approach for making the prediction of the transport. Another approach is this core plug experiments. Uh, so uh, we use advanced techniques like MI, MRI, ICE, uh, CT scan. So again, uh, we do pre and post and uh, these experiments are uh, relatively expensive uh, to to perform. So uh, I think I already talked about this. So uh, for the groundwater problem, supposedly we have you know microbes transport. So there we have attachment, detachment, filtration, microbial motility, and those kind of things that have that may have impact on the bioremediation process. Or uh, so we want to study them, and these the 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 experimental setup I talked about in the previous slide are not capable of capturing those processes. So uh, we wanted to do this, show these, uh, uh, you know, one of the process uh, of bacterial motility, which is called chemotaxis, uh, bacteria to get attracted or moves far from the contaminant, and that helps in designing the bioremediation uh, of a contaminated site. Uh, so we wanted to show these process. So what we did, we call it a plug, uh, experiment. So what we have basically, we have here in the, so here I'll explain this setup. So this is a microscopic slide and then two kind of side uh, cover slips and then one on the top. So kind of making bridge underneath that. Uh, but before we make that bridge, we actually drop this agrosose plug and we have uh, TCE in this. Uh, and so we drop that plug in the middle and then cover it from the top with this top slide. So kind of make uh, uh, like you know a, a chamber underneath, and then we inject the bacterial suspension from sides and gets flooded, and then we image that over time. So this top row here is showing images taken at different time points, and as you see here that uh, so what's happening here is that over the time the TCE in this agrosose plug diffuses out. Uh, in this thing, and then these microbes start responding to that concentration gradient and kind of started forming a ring around where the optimal concentration for the uh, the bacteria is. And you can see these nice rings forming over the time um, uh, where there's optimal concentration. Uh, while we did a control experiment where we had everything same, but there was no TC in there, so there was no diffusion, and we don't see that kind of accumulation as we see here. Uh, so uh, this kind of, if we if we exactly know how these things are taking place, uh, so they can be helpful in designing remediation strategy for uh, uh, groundwater. Um, so, but the, the limitation here is there is no porous media and still there is no flow. This is just a stagnant uh, experimental setup um, that we did. So. Um, our approach is to, to, to incorporate this porous media and laminar flow. Uh, so, uh, so our approach is, we call them traditionally micro models. So what a micro model basically is we have this aquifer and then what we essentially have in three dimension is uh, pour, these grains can be soil or uh, other types and then porous spaces in between and which is like, which would look like this in the two dimension. And so what we do is we kind of simulate this environment on a silicon wafer. So, uh, and we kind of idealize it. So we etch these pore spaces on this. So the cylinders here are representing uh, 
um, the, the the grains in the porous media and the pro in empty space here is the porous space. And so we etch it first and then we cover it with a glass, uh, another glass uh, wafer from the top. And then we kind of have, like this is a larger view. Uh, we have this funnel channel where we have inlets and then we have outlet and we can have different chemical species injected, depends on what we want to study and can kind of study it under the microscope. Uh, in the real time. And these are the, some of like, you know, this here showing uh, calcium carbonate growth and we can actually model those processes. Um, so uh, first example I wanted to go over is this paper that we published where what we were looking at is, um, uh, so uh, and basically uh, uh, the different process, so I'll, I'll just go over this thing. So. Uh, uh, in geological carbon sequestration, so uh, if you put this condensed high, you know, high pressure CO2 in deep subsurface reservoirs, so what starts happening is that uh, they start mixing with the brines and make that brine acidic. And because of the acidic, there is possibility that uh, it might start dissolving the cap rock or, or any area where there is uh, fault, it would just start dissolving this and uh, the, the, the CO2 injected might just pop out uh, on the surface uh, because of the, the acidic condition that uh, the CO2 creates. So uh, one of the uh, way to, to kind of deal with that is uh, uh, obviously to prevent the acidic formation of the acidic environment. So, so uh, uh, one of the way to do it is convert this CO2 into calcium carbonate, more solid form and uh, you know, that's in that way, it would just stay there or avoid forming, like getting pH low in the acidic zone. So uh, one of the things people recommend that for is biomineralization. What basically it is, is that uh, microbes uh, can help uh, forming, uh, like microbes can change, increase the pH of the, the uh, aqueous environment and they can increase the alkalinity and they can also provide nucleation site to form the calcium carbonate. So these all are favorable con conditions to convert that liquid CO2 into, into solid CO2. Uh, while uh, these knowledge is there, there is no consensus among people uh, that you know, what actually happens. Some people say it increases pH, some people say it changes alkalinity uh, or, or depends on one or two or all of those factors. So there is a debate about uh, uh, that and we wanted to study that mechanism. What is it that causing the, the precipitation uh, using our uh, this microfluidic experimental setup micro model? Uh, so before jumping into this uh, into the microfluidic experiment, what we did to investigate this uh, process, uh, you know, what what factor is causing this precipitation? So what we did is uh, we chose this bacteria Pseudomonas studzii. Uh, which is a, a gram-negative bacteria, and it's a denitrifying, denitrifying bacteria, basically. And what is known about this denitrifying bacteria is that it converts nitrate into, nit uh, into nitrogen. Uh, and during the process, it uh, consumes 1H plus ion concentration, so that would prevent uh, in, uh, reducing uh, pH, like acidic condition, prevent acidic condition, and at the same time, it uh, forms 5 8 molar of uh, HCO3 per mole of nitrate reduction. Uh, so basically, basically, this is what we have. Per mole of nitrate reduction, we have this electronic degeneration and this H plus ion consumption. So uh, we wanted to set up here. So we had our media at 6.7, uh, alkalinity at 10, and then saturation. Uh, and we calculated that this was the saturation index. Uh, for the, uh, at these conditions for calcium carbonate formation. Uh, um, so, and I think this is corresponding to 30 millimolar concentration of uh, uh, ca calcium ions. Um, so what we saw, like if we, we, we did these batch experiments here, and what we do, we have these things and we put this 30 millimolar uh, calcium ion concentration. And after 24 to 48 hours when 
uh, all the uh, nitrate is reduced into nitrite, uh, we saw that the pH increases to 7.2 and alkalinity increases to 18 millimolar. Uh, and then the saturation you know, index becomes high. And so that's a favorable condition for calcium ion precipitation. And I should have mentioned that you know, these are, uh, we, we feed five millimolar of nitrate and 7.5 millimolar of acetate in it. And so basically these input condition here result into this when this nitrate is completely consumed. So, um, uh, so we wanted to set up that these the, the, whatever we did in the batch experiment in this flow experiment. So we had acetate uh, and calcium going from here, and so in first state, basically we just put acetate and nitrate here. So there's a three-step process. Uh, so first we just put these acetate and nitrate and let the biofilm grow in the middle, uh, and we don't have any calcium carbonate. And then we wanted to test. So one way, there are two ways we test it. And step two, uh, we know that uh, if we put six, if we put uh, um, five millimolar nitrate, the pH and alkalinity goes to this point here, uh, 7.2 and 18 millimolar. But we wanted to do that first to see the effect of bacteria. So what we did in step two is abiotically increase those influent pH and alkalinity to what was expected uh, uh, in step two. And then uh, step three, we bring back, back the influent concentration. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this 10 millimolar in a bit. Uh, and then uh, kind of let the bacteria metabolize and they would result in this pH and alkalinity to this level. Uh, so basically, uh, we want to look at the calcium carbonate precipitation in, in, in these two different conditions. In summary, basically, we are, we are achieving the same pH, alkalinity, and nucleation condition in step two and three, uh, just that in step two, it's being achieved abiotically without any bacterial help, bacterial metabolism. And then in step three, it is being done uh, by the bacteria. Uh, so here are our uh, results. And so this is the step first, where we just see the biofilm growing here. Uh, I was seeing two of them. I'll come to that uh, in a moment. Uh, so we saw two biofilm line growing. And then once ha we have that biofilm establishing. And one more thing I want to uh, um, talk about, uh, maybe I should have talked it here, uh, is that I'm using a 10 millimolar concentration rather than five, as I did in the previous experiment. The reason for that is that uh, we have uh, twice the flow, basically. So we don't have any uh, nitrate here. We have nitrate going into only on one arm of the flow channel. Uh, so basically, we are assuming that uh, this would be one to one dilution. And in, in, in the reactive transport zone, it would be 50-50. So that's why we inject 10. So half of that would be 5 millimolar concentration. Um, so uh, what we see here is that when we have abiotic condition, pH and alkalinity 7.2 and 18 millimolar, uh, we didn't see any precipitation. We don't see any calcium carbonate precipitating here. While in step three, the same pH and alkalinity that we were expecting, we see a lot of calcium carbonate precipitation here. So uh, what the take home message here is uh, that uh, uh, here in these two conditions, the pH and alkalinity are same, even nucleation condition, because we are expecting that there's no growth of biofilm. So uh, the three conditions were same, but uh, but we don't see precipitation here. We see precipitation in where the bacteria was metabolizing, basically. And I don't want to go in further detail because that would take too much time, but we actually further confirmed it that uh, uh, it was active meta uh, metabolizing bacteria that causes precipitation, not just pH, alkalinity, and nucleation. In addition to that, we need bacteria metabolizing simultaneously. What that we, we, we did the surface charge measurement of these bacteria, and the bacteria that were metabolizing were surface, negatively surface charged as compared to the ones that were not, and that kind of drove this precipitation. Um, so uh, yeah, you can just see zoom in view of the biofilm as well as uh, the, the, the calcium carbonate precipitate we formed there. Um, so uh, uh, there's, uh, as you see this, uh, I was talking about, there are two kind of thin line of 
uh, there's one thinner, one thicker line of uh, biofilm growing. And then calcium carbonate precipitation actually did not take place on uh, the thicker line, which were more expected, versus it, it, it occurred when there was low concentration of, uh, of the biofilm, like there was not denser biofilm, so which was kind of a uh, uh, surprise to us. And uh, the, the special distribution of this uh, calcium carbonate precipitation. So um, we kind of thought that, okay, so this, this precipitation is not taking, uh, like basically nitrate reduction into nitrogen is not one step, but is a two step process. So we have a hypothesis here that maybe nitrogen is, nitrate is going into nitrite in the first step, which is probably taking place here on where the denser biofilm growth line is. And then nitrite is going into the nitrogen in the second step, which is taking place here. So we have this hypothesis. So in this first case, we don't have any H plus ion consumption, so no pH increase basically. Uh, and that's why we don't see any precipitation here. While here we have H plus ion consumption, pH is going up uh, and that's why we see precipitation. So that was the hypothesis. So we wanted to test this hypothesis and Han Q Yoon helped me uh, doing this, this uh, lattice Boltzmann modeling uh, where uh, you can see the different distribution, like at, at equilibrium, basically, distribution of different species. So you see the biofilm growth in due to two reasons. And, but most, most important here is basically uh, this nitrite removal, right? So here uh, on the D panel here, here it's showing uh, nitrite remaining, basically nitrate going into nitrite, so which is the upper biofilm growth line. Uh, and then nitrite removal basically is nitrite going into the, 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 the nitrogen. So this is where, and, and this pretty much matches with the calcium carbonate precipitation here. And that's what verifies that why we see precipitation here and not up here. And of course, like, you know, the pH has, uh, you know, basically all the other panels kind of matches uh, to the hypothesis. Um, so this was the first example and then the next example I wanted to give uh, about, and this is about, uh, um, this is relevant to the, the contaminant mixing in, in groundwater aquifers. So this is the paper we published long back in 2011 uh, from my PhD. Uh, so uh, we, and I just wanted to full, uh, emphasize here that the, the, there are two different ways of making these microfluidic channels. The one that I talked about before is, is for the, the, the um, is a silicon based and the one that I'm talking about now is a, is a PDMS based and you know there are different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we, we can talk about that if somebody's interested, but you know, so this is a PDMS based micro model where uh, we have basically, this is the bottom channel. So we had a like, you know, bilayer channel basically. So bottom channel where we have this porous media and then I have a top channel here. Uh, so which is bringing basically contaminant. We did tracer here. So we inject a tracer here that would inject here in the middle basically. And then we had kind of bacteria coming into the bottom channel. Uh, and, and then we were using this contaminant. Uh, uh, we basically, uh, we, we were simulating, we were using uh, this dye and then we're looking at dispersion of this dye basically. So this is uh, the kind of uh, a schematic. Um, so we designed, uh, and uh, what we were looking at is we wanted to look at if uh, uh, the, the bacteria help in, uh, in enhancing the contaminant mixing. So basically what, when we will inject, so we have, we have bacteria coming in the bottom channel and then at this point here, uh, uh, we were injecting these uh, dye, tracer dye, and we would expect this plume to form, right? And so uh, what we were looking at is if, if bacteria is moving, would that help in broadening this plume or uh, how, how that would affect? So that's what we wanted to study. So we designed this experiment. So in this B port, we always have this fit C dextron, basically that is our tracer and we're looking at dispersion of this tracer basically. And then in case one, like we have three type of experiments. So in first case, uh, we have the bacteria, which is motile and, you know, it's moving around. And uh, so we inject that bacteria in, in, in this one for the first type of, first types of experiment. 
And then in the second type, um, uh, we have the bacteria which is not active. We uh, kind of, uh, we have just random motility buffer, but we have no bacteria in the system. So uh, basically there's no bacteria present. But then we wanted to control because uh, the, the bacterial concentration was a little bit higher and we just thought if that's taking some pore spaces here. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to control for that. And what we did in that case is we had the same concentration of the bacteria, but we kind of, there, there's a chemical, I forgot the name, we uh, put that chemical in there. So that all the conditions of the bacteria remain same, except that they are not, they don't have any mobility anymore. Uh, so basically these two conditions are similar except in case one there's bacteria moving and then in case two bacteria is not moving and then we kind of chose this different location we collected data at this point basically images across these cross section and then we were looking at the mixing or uh, basically widening of these uh, uh, plume profile so well, this is one example where um, Plume profiles at 9.8 millimeter from upstream, and this is basically the this last one here. Uh, and we wanted to look at there. So there are three different experimental conditions that I explained. So on the left here, when there is bacteria moving, and then in the second one where there is no bacteria at all, and then the third one where we have uh, bacteria um, in the system but it's not moving. And what we saw, like visually inspection, we'll go into the analysis, uh, but we see that, uh, you know, just visual inspection, we have the wider profile in, in cases where there is motile bacteria versus when there is no bacteria or non motor bacteria. So that's just the visual inspection tells us that we have a kind of, you know, some kind of widening going on. And of course, we want to uh, the quantify this. Uh, dispersion process, how uh, this is when. So we use this, uh, uh, of course, like, you know, advection dispersion equation. So we have different assumption. Here there is, in the transverse direction, uh, or, or in the longitudinal direction, we don't have any concentration gradient. So, uh, you know, we uh, kind of neglect this term and different assumption, basically. And then we look at the analytical solution of this tracer in the transfer does transverse direction basically so this is the equation we will use where i is the concentration um uh the concentration um i think uh, it's the initial concentration and that's i i not is initial concentration and this is the concentration at any any dispersed direction uh so and we did only half analysis on the half side because it was going to be symmetrical on both sides uh, so this is the, the experimental profile that we got. Uh, and so we um, kind of, this is our model. So we wanted to fit that to this data. And so basically we have um, effective, uh, like we want to fit for this effective transfer disperse, uh, dispersion coefficient basically, uh, because we have everything known. We know the concentration, we know uh, different parameters, so we fit for the transverse, uh, effective transverse uh, disper dispersion coefficient, basically. Um, and so uh, we did that for like these three uh, different, um, uh, and then, then basically we, we conducted this experiment at three different flow rates. Uh, and, you know, th these examples here are at, you know, this particular cross section. Uh, and so uh, we got effective, and then we got, uh, what we did here basically, um, we, we got effective dispersion coefficient for, for the device, uh, our whole device, uh, which is this thing here. And uh, so um, then we, what we did, we use uh, this dispersion model, model where we have this, this diffusion coefficient. We know this for the, the tracer that we were using. And we know the velocity. We 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 conducted this experiment at different velocity, and so uh, basically we will fit for uh, uh, this uh, transverse dispersivity. That's what our aim is. And uh, uh, so basically these are our uh, transverse dispersivity values for different experimental uh, uh, conditions. Uh, 
here for this device uh, that I just talked about. And as you can see here, is we got much higher uh, effective uh, uh, um, dispersivity coefficient for motile bacteria as compared to other two uh, conditions, which shows that we, uh, the, the, the diffusion was uh, more when there was motile bacteria. And then, you know, I just don't want to go, I don't think I have this much time at hand, but then we had two other types of uh, design uh, and there were reason for choosing them. Uh, so, uh, but I won't go in that detail, but we, would say we were, we saw that there was about 2.3 times for increase in, in mixing basically uh, uh, in this case, as compared to, so there was no bacteria. Um, so, uh, so I, I just wanted to switch to this one. So these are the traditional experiment that people do with these uh, traditional micro model. But uh, you know, while they are good and we can do a lot of things with them, uh, there, there are certain limitations on, on these things. Uh, so if we look at the real subsurface condition, this is an uh, image that I took on the sandstone rock, uh, in the SEM image, and this is how the porous media look like versus this is how we analyzed it. So obviously this is not the ideal representation. And then here at the bottom, uh, on this is showing the chemical heterogeneity. So this is cathodoluminescence image, which is showing different chemical present here, uh, versus in our case where we had either PDMS-based or silicon-based uh, micro models. So they are not representing the chemistry of uh, uh, our chemistry of real subsurface media. So this is the paper we published, uh, I think last year or yeah, uh, about designing this new experimental setup which would realistically simulate uh, the subsurface uh, conditions. So what we had basically, um, we have this core, yeah, that's from North Sea core, like, you know, real subsurface core. And so we kind of make it a bullet. So basically the process here is we cut out these small uh, wafers. Those are 500 uh, micrometer thick, basically. So, so the idea of this whole process is uh, to cut these things. So uh, usually these are very crumbly and they would just disintegrate. So what we do is we put super glue on the surface of this tablet and then we stick it on the, the, the glass slide and then we chop up this top part. And then uh, once it's there, so we uh, basically then remove that super glue, which is there uh, using acetone and we get this paper. Um, and then we sort of make this PDMS channel, uh, so which has a geometry of like this. So this is the process here, how I do it. And then I got this uh, PDMS where it has a channel and then eventually we sort of uh, drop uh, this wafer, what we have, and then we drop it here in this channel and then cover it from the, the, from the bottom in this case. Uh, so essentially what I have is I have a, I have a real uh, sandstone piece or real rock piece sandwiched between two PDMS layers. And so we, we, we seal it from the sides as well. And then we have only outlet, inlet and outlet. And you know, it's showing here. So these are different layers. So we can, we can basically perform different type of experiment here. So we can inject things in here and we can have different designs to inlet or different things depends on what we want to do. And uh, it's a, so the, the idea here is to get the realistic porous media uh, as opposed to what we had before, which is the engineering material and doesn't represent the, the, the real subsurface. Um, so uh, we just did some preliminary, ex preliminary experiment uh, using this device. So here we were looking at uh, basically a breakthrough of uh, tracer or breakthrough of water. So we fill it with the with this dye and then we, once it was completely saturated, so we started flowing the water, like uh, DI water to see how that would replace. So it was not sweeping. We have, we can see that over the time we capture, there is preferential flow paths as compared to uh, our ideal model where we probably would not see these kind of things. Uh, you know, the, the kind of flow is uniform, more uniform as compared to here. Mm -hmm where we have uh, these preferential flow paths. Um, so these are just, and you know, these are different profiles at different times. 
And then we wanted to do the similar thing in 3D, uh, basically same experiment, but we are collecting the Z cross section here along the depth, basically uh, in a small area. Uh, and we wanted to show um, that how the, the, the three dimensional, uh, uh, basically along the depth, the, 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 the uh, water is displacing the dye and color coding here is shown here. So basically red color is showing the more depth and then the blue is uh, basically shallow depth. Uh, and so you can see that, uh, you know, as, as time progresses, uh, kind of, uh, we have shallow depth of, uh, you know, water um, and dye, sorry. And then, you know, it's this kind of, we can do multi-phase experiment uh, where uh, we have this, we have, we have three dyes here basically. So in step one, we have, we just saturate with this uh, uh, AF350 dye, which is blue dye, and then, this green dye, uh, which uh, we use to coat the, the um, light oil, and then we injected it from here. So again, we can see it has the preferential flow paths, and, and you know, different. Uh, it doesn't have the sweeping, so we, we can do different kind of uh, things using using these uh, flow studies. And then we wanted to see like how that the the, the non aqueous phase would flow. So we again. In third case, we use another dye, which is uh, which is a red fluorescent dye, and we inject it from this side. And as you can see here, that uh, it this dye kind of completely replaced the aqueous media, which is the blue one, but it did not replace the uh, the green one, which is a, a non aqueous phase, though it was able to kind of smoothen the, the these hard fringes. Uh, so uh, we can do different uh, kind of things uh, using using these devices. So now uh, the second part, and you know, I really need to cover it quickly. Uh, uh, so a chemical imaging part. So um, why we want to do chemical imaging for uh, the subsurface study? So um, uh, uh, so some of you probably know or you know that uh, I talked about this calcium ion, calcium carbonate precipitation and uh, so calcium has different forms. It can form as calcite, can veterite, or can regonite. And all these forms have different solubility index. They, the calcite is more stable versus regonite is least stable. So once we are doing this biomineralization process, we want to know that what form of calcium carbonate it formed. If it formed calcite, so it would be more stable, it would stay there. But if it's regonite, so probably might not stay uh, at the, at you know and it would dissolve back so we want to check those those things uh, and uh, our just these visual images uh, or optical images they don't tell us like what form of calcium carbonate we are forming here uh, similarly in in this the second example i showed uh, i'm using this uh, dextron um, dye which is a which is a surrogate which is a simulation of our real contaminant and real contaminant is not going to behave the way uh, this dye is going to behave, and that's why you know some of the prediction we would make might not be be um, useful. So what would be interesting is if we can know the chemistry like of this calcium carbonate formation or this dye, or so that we can use real contaminant and we know the chemistry of this. So that's where the chemical imaging come into picture, which is basically uh, Raman or IR spectroscopy that you can do. And uh, so the concept basically here is um, uh, on that. Um, so, so all the molecule in the world have uh, this basic thing. So they have atoms, right? And so atoms have different, mo uh, have by within molecule, they have different vibrations. They can be in different vibration mode. As I'm showing here, they can be symmetrically stretching, asymmetrically stretching, scissoring, wagging, rocking, twisting, and all kind of uh, yeah, the, the motion. And so basically what IR and uh, uh, Raman does is they study uh, these vibrations and these are characteristic of specific chemical present in, in, in the sample. Um, so uh, I just wanted to focus here is that uh, this is vibrational spectroscopy. So Raman is a, uh, is a scattering process where basically you shine, uh, and I probably go here. Uh, so basically in Raman process, you have this sample where you have these molecules. 
So you have a fixed wavelength light, you throw it here on the sample, and so it would get scattered based on its interaction with these vibrations. And then we collect light, uh, scattered light, which, which would have a change frequency or shift in uh, wavelength. And then we collect that, and that's kind of around Raman measurement, and we measure this. For IR, um, it's an absorption process. And absorption process, so what we do, we have, we have the incident light, and then these molecules will, will absorb some of the light, and then we kind of study the missing light, basically. The one that we come out, we look for the ones that are missing because they have, these frequencies have been absorbed uh, by the RAM, by, by this molecule. Uh, so this is what I'm showing here. This is Raman. We put a lot of photons here. They get absorbed, and then we kind of filter them, and then we count, like, you know. So we, if we have 785 nanometers, and this, Will some of these molecules would go change in their, their wavelength? And we change, we kind of count how many photons are at 789 and other different wavelengths. And so we get this kind of result. So this is basically the count at different wave, wave number or different uh, here. And this is a typical Raman spectra. And uh, all of these peaks have their specific chemical significance, which is shown here, uh, different vibrational, different meaning. Uh, we can we can find out that in the literature once we collect the spectra, uh, and of course I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but but basically that's the idea that you kind of capture the real chemistry. Uh, so this is what we did for this uh, calcium carbonate precipitation experiment, um, and uh, so uh, these are the spectra uh, obtained uh, for different uh, things. So. Basically, once you see, so this is a typical uh, calcite peak where, I mean, among this, this, uh, I forgot, like this is 710, and basically this 1081. So if it is calcite, so you would have like just one peak at this point, versus if it is a veterite, so we have kind of a doublet peak here. So like this B, which is here, is basically a veterite versus these other ones, C and D, these are calcite molecules. And similarly here, so we have these veterite and this is calcite. So basically we, you, can, you can capture the chemistry of this thing. And similarly, we, did, uh, we really did not do any experiment with the, the, the flow cell, uh, uh, the, the rock flow cell we developed, but uh, we uh, sort of wanted to check the capability that if we could do similar measurement on, on this flow cell, and we were able to capture the Raman spectra and you know, look at the different because it automatically has different chemistry in, in the porous media itself, and we were able to capture some of it using using the Raman spectroscopy. Um, so, a uh, couple of other projects that I did, uh, I'll just quickly go through these things. Uh, so, and this is one paper that uh, this is I work with Rohit. Uh, so, we were working in soybean project where we were interested in uh, developing a Raman instrument that we can take. Uh, at on site and uh, do the characterization of these uh, soybeans in situ, uh, you know, at the site, uh, basically to know what, how much protein, lipid, or um, you know, carbohydrates in it. And then depends on if it is high lipid, it can go for uh, if it can go for like biofilm or those kind of things. Or if it has high, um, uh, if, if it has high uh, protein, then it, it can be good for, for nutritional purpose. So the idea is we do different experimental treatment, we collect Raman, and then we develop different kind of models and we do the prediction of different chemicals. So we, here I'm showing the lipid predictions, and these are individual lip, lipids, uh, and so on. So we had this Raman spectra, we did PLS and MLR models, and this is one of the things. So here, uh, these are the reference values on x-axis, uh, using uh, HPLC methods, and then on y-axis we have a Raman predicted, and as you can see that they are pretty much on one-on-one -on -one line, and did a good job in terms of predicting these uh, lipids. And similarly, uh, for these individual amino acids, so not just the bulk uh, protein, but we could just do these individual amino acids, and you know, uh, kind of make good models uh, for prediction based on the Raman data. Um, this. Um, one like you know that I did with uh, uh, Dr. Elfan Ahmed and you know Hanafi, uh, and so what we had uh, 
is we were looking at the degradation of the paints on military aircrafts. So using using fungus. So we grew these fungus on, on, on these metals which were coated. And so here is the zoomed in views. This is the, the fiber here is the fungus growing on, on the surface of this uh, paint. And so what we did is, and, and these measurements were IR measurements, we just kind of picked a small area here. Uh, I think it was a 65 micron by 65 micron area and then collected data there. And so this kind of map I'm showing here, so I'm not going to go in the detail, but here on the left-hand side, and this I believe is 64 by 64 micron area. And so where on left side, what I'm showing is the distribution of uh, these fungus. And on the right hand side here, uh, I'm showing the distribution of, uh, of the paint. So what you can see, these are kind of complementary plots. So wherever there is high density of uh, uh, fungus, like these areas, we have the lower density of, um, mm, lower density of um, paint basically. And where there is no fungus, we have more density of, of the paint. So basically, we were able to characterize uh, the areas where we see we see the degradation are corresponding to where the, the, the fungus are present. And so these are some of my, I have some ideas about uh, making these, uh, there, there are some limitation about, uh, their PDMS is not compatible with Raman and different things. So we could use different material like calcite for making the micro models and make progress in this direction. And so this was, uh, uh, you know, in long term, if we can have uh, uh, these Raman-based probes, so we could, they, they, some of them already exist, but they don't do a good job in terms of uh, doing metal or, you know, micro concentration. So if we can develop those Raman-based probes, so that would be really helpful. And then this last one, I'll take like 30 seconds. Uh, uh, so this project we have started, uh, uh, one of the projects I'm working on is in a public health issue. Uh, so basically what we're looking at is we have the competing goals here, right? Uh, so if we, uh, in, in water heaters, if you keep temperature uh, below 60 degrees, so it's good for Laginilla growth, and then that can be uh, problematic. Uh, versus if we have high, then we can have scalding or we can, it can lead to corrosion and, you know, this thing. Similarly, disinfection byproduct, uh, uh, we want to have residual uh, concentration of chlorine, but at the same time, if we have that sitting, you know, there's long water age, so we can have the issue of disinfection by product. And similarly, uh, water quality versus water conservation. So there is a huge effort on water conservation, like having low flush, per flush volume or low uh, flow showers. But what's that happening is that that's kind of increasing the age of water in the building. Uh, in building plumbing, and uh, that is again you know, problematic from from a lot of uh, perspective. So uh, that's what I wanted to just say. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer, and you can email me if you have uh, if you don't get a chance to ask now. Thanks, Raj. Um, We'll take questions in just a second. I wanted to remind our online audience that you can type in your questions into the question chat box uh, on your GoToWebinar toolbar. So are there any questions from our audience here? Yeah. So in the soybean uh, predictions that you did with uh, for the oils and the proteins, are you able to find the different fatty acids also uh, with the help of this modeling tool or just the total oil and the total protein? Yeah, so these are, I think, you know, the one that I was talking about. Um, these are individual fatty acids, right? Omega-3 fatty acid or oleonic or like, you know, these are individual fatty acids. So we were able to predict those basically. So what 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 this is, and I'm sorry, I went like really fast on these slides because I was running out of time. But what we do is basically we collect these Raman data, right? And then we send these same samples to the wet lab and get the wet chemistry on these individual amino uh, these individual lipids. So we have the chemistry, chemical data from like uh, 
SPLC data. And then we have this, uh, this Raman spectra. And so we see that, okay, what features, you know, it would, like model would use different feature of this Raman spectra and would try to predict this thing basically. So uh, to, to, in, in, in short, uh, to answer your question directly, yes, we were able to predict these individual amino acid, uh, uh, fatty acids. Uh, so, will you be able to assign the peaks in Raman to different fatty acids, or you are taking the whole spectrum and then you are doing uh, treatment of that spectrum and then you are doing the prediction? We can, like you know, model will tell tell us. Uh, um, we uh, that should be able. To, I mean, we haven't done it whole. We have done these uh, peak assignment for this particular for for amino acids. Or actually, in, as a whole, like we didn't do individual one. We did when we did bulk protein and bulk oil, we did assign it. So, but but uh, I think that can be done. Model can tell us. We look at uh, these. Um, you know, for this particular one is a PLS. Uh, this thing, PLS prediction. So we 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 should be able to look at the uh, um, PLS coefficient, and it could not be just one peak because the PLS kind of picks bunch of them at the same time, but we should be able to point, okay, this peak has a maximum influence on this particular component production versus, you know, other peak has on other, other comp uh, you know, other component. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions from our audience here? No? And we don't have any questions online at this time. Raj, can you put up your contact information again? Yeah, sure. Great. So um, I'll formally end the seminar, but if you need to contact Raj about anything, he is available on the screen right now. Thanks.